Okay. All right, so chapter 23 is the beginning of the modern era, 1750 to 1914. We're going to see a variety of themes, and this is a pretty common for the first chapter in each era. It's going to be a thematic approach to the entire time period. So you're going to find information in this chapter that runs from 1750 all the way up through 1914, which is going to be a little bit confusing for you because they're going to be talking about stuff that happens in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. And then you're going to go to chapter 24, and we're going to go right back to 1750 again. And they're going to approach it from a different theme. Chapter 24 is about European imperialism, going out into the world and conquering. Chapter 25 is about stuff happening in Latin America. So you're going to find that each chapter is going to run through the whole time period, start to finish, on a new topic. So if you understand it from that standpoint, it won't be quite as confusing. Maybe. We hope. All right, so general overviews. The beginning of this era is marked by a period of chaos. Chaos doesn't necessarily mean bad. It just means lots and lots of change very, very quickly. One of the things that will cause lots and lots of change very quickly is a period of political revolutions. Now, the American colonies in North America are going to lead off this run of revolutions. And you guys learned most of this story in middle school, which is why we're not going to touch on it much. The only reason we're going to talk about it at all is because the revolution in what will become the United States serves as an example of what is possible. A colony is capable of overthrowing a European power. They are, but they don't have the resources that a European country would. And that's what made it impressive. It's a smaller population living in an underdeveloped area that hasn't yet been fully taken advantage of. And from a European biased perspective, the colonies shouldn't be able to overthrow a European power because they're backwoods hillbillies. So the fact that the American colonists can kick the British out is seen as kind of a symbol of hope. If they can do it, so can we. James? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so once it's happened once, it gives people hope that, the similar, that a similar, seemingly impossible task could actually be done again. So it's going to give hope to all of those Davids to slay those Goliaths. Oh, lots of them are successful. Outside of the Americans, it depends on how we're going to measure success. Another example is going to be the French Revolution, where after centuries of control by absolute monarchs, most of whom are named Louis, the French people finally rise up and overthrow their monarch. And they execute him and his wife and 40,000 other French people. Question? Answer. Was the guillotine, uh, I read that in the book that said the guillotine was used to um, be more humane? Yep. Is that like... Why is it more humane? Like, what was the previous method of execution? Axe. Ooh. And the reason axe and sword was considered inhumane is they get dull and or it takes a really strong person to swing it and go clean through the neck in one blow. So what happens is you'd, you know, you'd swing and it gets stuck, like you hit the bone, it gets caught up in a muscle, and now you're trying to wrench it out real quick and like the person's jiggling and then you try to do it again but you rush the blow and then you miss and now they're in lots of pain and they're screaming and people are all confused. It's just bad. So the idea with the guillotine is you take a very, very heavy blade. Sharp blade. Well, a very sharp blade cut at a 45 degree angle so that the longer point of the blade goes through first it makes a sawing motion and it chops through in one blow with gravity doing all the work so you're not relying on human power clearly that is far more humane than two or three whacks with an axe Stephen go ahead yes because they would often hold up the head of the executed and the eyes would blink and the mouth would 
Really? Yeah. Disgusting. Okay, so the U.S. Revolution shows that it's possible to overthrow a colonial power from far, far away. The French Revolution shows that it's possible to overthrow a monarch in your own country, and it kind of validates people's feelings of abuse. That if you feel like your government is not doing its job, you can rise up and rebel, and you can be successful. Once those two happen, you are going to see revolutions take place throughout the Americas. Now, which colonial power owns most of the Americas? The Spanish. And so the Spanish are going to have their hands full with most of their territory in Central and South America rebelling. And it's going to be like a row of dominoes. Uh, the island of Haiti in the Caribbean is going to rebel against kind of joint control by the Spanish and the French. And the slaves will rise up and rebel against the slave owners, which is a problem for the slave owners because for every slave owner, there was like a thousand slaves. So it was not good odds. And this is when Napoleon is in power in France, and so his plans to rule the world are very quickly shattered by the fact that he can't even hang on to one little teeny tiny island. Right. So then after the Haitian Revolution, then you will have revolutions throughout South America, Venezuela, Bolivia, Argentina, uh, led by a number of people from the Creole class, which if you remember our chapter 19 on Latin America, who are the Creoles? Mari? All right, they're Europeans that grow up in the Americas. So they're not mestizo or mulatto. They're not European and native, European and slave. They are full-blooded Europeans that are looked down on because they grow up in the Americas. And so it will be these Creoles that oftentimes lead the rebellions in South America. Okay, so that's been like, I don't know, four minutes so far. We've touched on four different revolutions and not given you details on much of any of them. See how much there is to know in this chapter? Yeah. We said Napoleon's name and added like three other words. And that's all you're going to get on Napoleon. Yet you still need to know Napoleon. So, good luck. Read the chapter. Okay, so, other examples of chaos and change. Industrialization. Industrialization is going to be incredibly chaotic in Europe because it will fundamentally alter the way that human beings live and work. So, prior to industrialization, what do most people do for a living? They farm. And in the event that they are not a farmer, what are some of the other options? Merchants, craftspeople. And if you're, and we're talking lower class. If you are a craftsperson, chances are good that you do your work in your house. What's called cottage industry. You are industrious in your cottage. You work from home, basically. But not work from home like today, where it's all cushy and you work in your pajamas but you only have the tools and resources that, that are available in your home and you will typically only do one step of a process. So, the process of making clothing from wool. You would have one person who would shear the sheep and then collect the wool and that would be their part of the process and they would collect all that wool and they would sell it to somebody else maybe in the next village over, maybe somebody in the same village. And that person is going to card the wool, strip it and remove all the debris and wash it. But that's all they can do with the resources they have. So they're going to take all this clean carded wool and they're going to send it to a spinner. And that person is going to spin this carded cleaned wool into thread. But that's all they can do with the resources they have available. So now they're going to send the thread to a seamstress and that seamstress is going to turn that thread into a product and then sell that. That's how cottage industry works. By the end of this time period, we're going to see factories where the process is taken from start to finish inside a building and it's done in a matter of hours or minutes rather than days or weeks. Yeah. How did they think of that? How did they think of what? How did they make factories and how did they machine? Well, they had to come up with some new inventions first in order for people to even begin to think that this was possible. And many of these inventions are so big that they couldn't be housed in somebody's cottage. They had to build a building specifically to fit something like a steam engine. And so at that point, it's like, well, if the machine's here, why don't we just bring the process here? With industrialization, you are first going to have to ask the question, should we industrialize? 
If you are a cottage industry style worker, are you excited about industrialization? Why not? Because you can't work at home anymore. Why else? Machines take your job. You're not needed. As the machines get more advanced, they don't need you to clean the wool or spin the wool. It's like, right. It's like car manufacturers. If you ever watch a video of an assembly line in a car plant, it's amazing how few people are involved in the process and how many robotic arms are swinging around like dropping doors and hinges and screwing things and like people are like, yep, looks good. There's a sticker, looks good. What's that? Very. They're crazy good. Nick? Did you ever hear about the story in France, the early sewing machines, where um, there was this factory that had the sewing machines in it, and mm -hmm. all the local French um, sewing machines went in and destroyed the sewing machines because they saw it as too much of comp competition? Mm -hmm. I have heard that story. And that will be something that plays itself out as societies industrialize. People will be threatened by this change, and they don't want it. People don't like change. Change is scary. Change means things will be different and maybe they won't be as good. Now, one of the other things that's going to happen at the same time is urbanization. We already saw this a little bit as feudalism came to an end and more people moved to the cities. But now that you really don't need the majority of the population to farm, guess where people go? To the cities. Because what job can you do there now? Factory. Work in a factory. So you will now see cities around the world very quickly clear the one million mark in terms of population. And you will have cities with millions or tens of millions of people. The upside of that is what? All right, more labor. What else, Stephen? Cultural diffusion. Having that many people in that confined a space I mean, think about what we commonly you know, think of when we think of places like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. What do we think of? All right, bustling streets, lots of people, traffic sucks. But what are the good things about it? Everything's close by. Everything's close by. What, Paul? Every culture. Lots of cultures. You got like, you know, Chinatown and Little Italy and... Uh, you know, whatever the other different ethnic groups are, but you can find those things. Right? I mean, you find all kinds of cool little things side by side by side. What else do you get? Are they still pros? Yeah, still pros. More ideas. Okay, big companies. All right, big companies and lots of them, so there's competition because that's where the workers are. Nick? Lots of ideas being spread around. Lots of ideas being spread around, whether it's technology, whether it's art, whether it's music. I mean, how often do we see concerts out here versus how often do you hear about concerts in D.C.? I mean, there's concerts in D.C. every night in a hundred different places. Concerts. Thanks, Mike. All right, but there's also definitely cons. And we touched on the traffic. What else comes with? Disease. Disease, because you got that many more people living in close proximity. What else? Sahil? Communication, Communication issues. How so? Right? So with all those cultures, you get all those languages, and it makes, maybe makes it difficult for people to actually communicate with each other until they learn. Hannah? Uh, pollution. What's that? Pollution. pollution. Absolutely. That many people produce a lot of garbage, a lot of air pollution, water pollution, whatever. Paul? Um, because there's so many workers, they would get less money, so there would be more people. Yeah. If there's so many workers, if you are an employer, if you own a factory, and you need 100 workers, and you can pick from a thousand, what do you get to do? Pick the best and pick the wages. Be like, I'm gonna offer you a dollar. 900 of them go away, and the last 100 that are desperate to work be like, I'll take a dollar.
great you're hired. How does that make who poor? Okay. Nick? There are more people, like what you said, there are limited spots because there are more people without jobs who are just wandering out the street. Right, which leads to? Crime. Crime. Very good. All right, other fun things happening during this period of chaos and change. We are going to see changes to how women and children are viewed. Um, for women, where do we, and you guys are fantastic about this, which drives me crazy, but anytime we ask you a question about gender roles, what's the first thing you say? Women aren't treated as equals, followed by patriarchal society, followed by women are only valued and powerful in the home. Okay. Yep. Language gets lazy. Yep. Yep. All right. So if women have only been powerful in the home, when you flip that logic on its head, why were women given power in the home? Go ahead. Okay, so if women were forced to stay in the home and do all those homey type things, but they weren't trusted to be in government or be in the military or be in the economy, why were they trusted to be in the home? Because think about it, raising children is kind of an important task. Right, but... Okay. So clearly this is acknowledging that women actually do have significant abilities that are valued. That women, women, woman as caretaker is a valuable, skilled position. That actually when you think about it conveys a pretty significant testimony to their skills and abilities. Right. I mean, if women can be entrusted with caring for life, I mean, that's, that's pretty significant. If women have the moral ability and the intellectual ability to raise a human life to the point of being able to function as an adult, that's pretty amazing. And if men don't have that? Or are left to get that Right. And that actually says a great deal about women, rather than marking them as inferiors. And that sort of logic is going to begin to play out during this time period. They're going to flip the argument of women's rights and abilities on its head. And instead of continuing this conversation of how little women can accomplish, and how little women are valued, they're actually going to go, wait a minute. If women are put in charge of life and raising our children, men or women, which then become adults, doesn't that mean that women are amazingly competent? That's going to begin what we come to refer to as the feminist movement. The feminist movement. When women throughout Europe will begin to petition for and fight for the kinds of rights that have long been withheld from them. The right to vote and participate in government. The right to use these skills that are so valued in the home in the rest of society. It's a long, long overdue moment, and it's not going to happen quick. But by the end of this time period, you will see women being given the right to vote in many Western nations. 
and you will see them begin to play much larger roles in society and in the economy. You are also going to see the value of children change, and we mentioned this during your reading quiz earlier. The number of children that are born goes down because they are no longer needed as labor in a farming community. Instead, in an urban society, fewer children makes more sense because you now need fewer resources to take care of them. And, and too many would be a burden. And children are now going to be viewed differently. They are going to be viewed as a priceless treasure rather than a source of cheap labor. Societies will now create mandatory education for children the kinds of stuff that you guys are subjected to now, based on the belief that you are valuable. Based on the belief that you should be cherished and nurtured and protected and given an opportunity to have a limitless future rather than the, than the belief that, well, your bodies are young so you can more easily handle manual labor and your bodies will recover quicker, so get out in the field and work. Get smart later, maybe. Okay. Dave? Uh, when did the uh, children should be seen and not heard really start to be phased out a lot? Oh, well, that, I mean, just because we're talking about children being valued doesn't mean yeah, that children no, have the right to say what they want. No, I mean, like, should be seen and not heard, like, um, That's like a 1960s and 70s thing. Okay, when they uh, really could be more local? Well, parenting gets a little bit more liberal. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. So it's not until much later. Right. All right, another major trend, and we're not really going to touch on it now other than to say that it happens because this is what Chapter 24 is all about, imperialism. Imperialism is the European interest and takeover in most of the rest of the world that they haven't touched yet. You know how we talked about the slave trade earlier? Europeans will now go to Africa and colonize. You know how we talked about Europeans wanting to trade in India and China before? They will now go there and conquer. Could you repeat what imperialism is? It's the Europeans' desire to go and control foreign areas. And we now have a reason to talk about Australia, however briefly, because Australia will be yet another destination that Europeans go to in an attempt to colonize and control. And at first, Australia will serve no other purpose than to house the criminals that the British don't want to deal with. And so they'll put them on a ship, and they'll sail it to Australia, and they'll kick them off, and they'll say, see ya, good luck. And it's like the first version of Survivor. Except you don't get voted off the island, you just get dead. Okay. Hey, wasn't Australia better than the alternative where they just lock up you in a ship sitting in the Thames or the Thames River until you die? Well, it depends, I guess, on how you prefer to die. I mean, if you want to die from poisonous snake bite versus, you know, disease on a ship without having to go far from home. Six to one, half a dozen of the other. Australia. Didn't they also have set groups of governors and guards to go and build the facilities? Eventually, yeah. Yeah, eventually. Alia? What about the people in Australia? The Aborigines? The Europeans are as concerned about them as they are about the natives in the Americas. Some do, um, but I mean, Australia, Australia still has an Aboriginal population today that continue to preserve that kind of natural way of life, which if you guys ever saw the movie that came out, I think, in the 80s, Crocodile Dundee. I have a question. Uh, a question like, um, what did the original population of Australia look like? In terms of numbers? No, I mean, only just like physical features. I don't. Well, that's how they're portrayed in the movie. Whether or not that's realistic, I have no idea. I try not to base my because, uh, historical information off of Paul Hogan movies. Yeah, I'm just curious because we have the whole white population, whatever you call it, population there from like right. the criminals were sent there to guard. Right. But I'm curious. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming they're darker skinned, but I don't know if they look like Africans, if they look like people from India. Or if they're some sort of. Like, right. Most of the Polynesian Islanders are, you know, very 
dark skin, but not quite you know the dark brown black that we associate with Africa. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's what the native population actually looks like. Okay, so well, Aboriginal just means original people. It is. I don't know what to tell you, but Aboriginal means original people. I blame the Latin. Okay. I blame the different use of Latin. That could be it too. We covered a couple revolutions in, you know, two minutes. What we're going to spend slightly more time on is the Enlightenment, the ideas that prompt these revolutions. Right, Paul? There's going to be four primary philosophers during the Enlightenment whose ideas will shape the revolutions and the governments that come after the revolutions. And we have their lovely mug shots right here. John Locke will be the first. And John Locke believed that people were basically reasonable and if people are basically reasonable, what can you trust them with? Power. power. If people are basically reasonable, you could trust them with power. More importantly, John Locke believed that every single human being on the planet, man or woman, was deserving of a few natural rights. That simply by virtue of being born you had these rights. They weren't given to you by a government. They weren't conditional on your behavior. That simply by virtue of being born and alive, you had the right to life, liberty, and property. Property. You had the right to your life. You had the right to not have that life be taken from you arbitrarily. Let's say by a monarch who just wanted to execute you for no good reason. Similarly, you had the right to liberty, your freedom. And you had the right to not have your freedom taken away from you, which basically means no slavery. And you had the right to your property. The things that are yours should not be taken from you, which means no outrageous taxation. It means government should not be able to seize private property. Now, does that phrase, life, liberty, property, sound familiar? Yeah. Right, we borrow that for the Declaration. Thomas Jefferson utilizes Locke's phrasing and then just dresses it up a little bit. Montesquieu. That's how you say it? Yes. Montesquieu believed that people were basically good, but when people become rulers, that power corrupts them. So people are good, rulers are touch and go. So would you want to put power in the hands of one person? No. no. Montesquieu believed in a separation of powers. Preferably three branches of power. An executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. Sound familiar? Yeah. 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 